Good morning, everybody. Everybody good? Welcome. Um, welcome to our seventh annual New York State Brewers Conference. Uh, we've got a big few days ahead of us, uh, but before we get started, I really need to thank all of our sponsors. Uh, without their support, along with your attendance, this would not be possible. They've invested in, uh, in being here, and they've invested in the NYSBA by supporting this conference. I also like to recognize our official sponsoring partners who make a significant investment beyond allied membership to support us throughout the year. A big thank you goes out to Lucky Hair Brewing Company for uh, the toast this morning. We're gonna kick off the conference in a few minutes. Don't open the beer yet. We're all gonna open it together. Um, and I also really need to thank um, TLF Graphics, Ironheart Canning, The Hop Guild, and New York Craft Malt, who all donated to this beer, so thank you. Don't open it yet, thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, our conference sponsors are a really important part uh, to make all this happen, and I wanna give them a quick shout out. Thank you to Ollie and The Hop Guild for sponsoring last night's welcome party, uh, and we'd also like to thank Common Roots for hosting at the new location. Who, who went there? What a great place. Thank you, Christian Weber. Like, it was really great last night. Thank you uh, for having us. Uh, Direct Source Packaging for being the swag bag sponsor. This year's lanyards are uh, sponsored by Brew Recruit. For the second year in a row, we have the Hop Steiner Scholarship. This scholarship was awarded to Donna Bregartner, head brewer at Bellport Brewing Company. Is Donna here? Donna, is she here? Where? Oh. Uh, well, congratulations, Donna, for uh, winning the Hop Steiner uh, Scholarship this year. Uh, all of the beer stations are sponsored by Hopsteiner, Amoretti, and the Hop Guild. Uh, and thank you to all the brewers that donated beer. There is a ton of beer to share. Uh, there's a beer station over here, Hopsteiner's. There's a beer station over here, and then there's a beer station downstairs. So we have three beer stations. Um, we also uh, want to thank Acrisure New York uh, for sponsoring the wellness area. MMB & Co. for sponsoring the stage. Um, our lounge sponsor is the Creveller Group. Uh, that's on the first floor, the lounge is. Uh, our social sponsor is Lyndon Meyer Monroe. Our official snack sponsor is Heart Print. This year's keynote address is sponsored by Weber Packaging. Our uh, official sponsor for apparel is Viatran. Our glassware sponsor is Prestige Glassware. There is um, a table downstairs of, of pint glasses. Uh, please take one uh, when you go down there. Our signage sponsor is TLF Graphics. Um, thank you for all of the great signage and all the floor decals and things. Our entertainment sponsor is BMI. Uh, let's see. Our break room sponsors are Genray, Videojet, Van Elstein and Sons, Power Market, and Genesis PPG. And finally, there will be a happy hour and light dinner right here in this room from six to seven tonight, sponsored by Country Malt Group and Yakima Chief Hops. So thank you, all you sponsors. Let's give them a round of applause, please. As you can see, we've, uh, for those that came last year, who's here last year? All right, we, all right awesome, great, welcome back. Um, we've rearranged a little bit uh, this year. We have um, over 100 exhibitors uh, this year, and we've kind of uh, rearranged so to make it more accessible for you to visit all of them, all of them. Many come from all over the country and Canada to be here. So please, visit them all. Uh, take a few minutes. Um, uh, they've come a long way to be here um, so that they could see you. Uh, the wellness area is back um, this year. So that's downstairs and it's sponsored by Acrisure. Uh, there you can take a break, get a massage, simply take a, take a breath uh, and enjoy a little downtime. Uh, there's gonna be mental, mental health resources downstairs, NA beer and other non-alcoholic beverages and snacks. So please feel free if you feel like you want to take a break to go downstairs in our wellness area. Uh, let's see here. Finally, uh, our annual brewers meeting is today at 5 p.m. downstairs in room 1A. Uh, that's where we're going to go through all NYSB up updates and financials. Uh, this is open to brewery members only, uh, which is designated on your badge. You will know it'll be on there if you're a brewery member. Uh, the allied member meeting takes place at the same time in room 2C. Both of those rooms are downstairs. Uh, I want to take a moment to recognize our NYSBA board of directors. This is your board of directors. Um, they, uh, they're here um, in attendance. Board members, do you want to stand up, recognize yourself? That's them right there. Board members, come on, stand up. There we go. 
Uh, I want you to see their faces so you can say hello to them, talk to them, um, and, and tell them what you want to see in the industry, if there's something that you, you'd like to see more. Uh, I also need to thank uh, my incredible staff. Um, this is, uh, this wouldn't be possible. A special thank you needs to go out to Megan Connolly Haupt, who is back there, who really did a lot of producing uh, of this conference, um, all the moving parts, uh, and also need to thank Emily. Uh, wherever Emily is, she's probably downstairs in registration. The process was really great. There she is, down there. Uh, and I want to thank Chloe Kay as well. Chloe, uh, all of the great um, artwork and things, all the design stuff that you see is Chloe. So, so thank you. They're, they're an amazing staff, and, and um, I'm so lucky to have them. Um, so before we begin, um, it was a tough year this year. Um, hang on one second. Before, I, before I introduce uh, our first past president, Rich Vandenberg, uh, I do want to recognize that it was a tough year this year. Our industry lost five members of the brewing community since we were here last. Um, I'd like to recognize them now and observe a moment of silence in their honor. Brian Baker uh, was co-owner and brewer at Bellport Brewing Company on, <coughs> excuse me, on Long Island. Brian had a true passion and love for his family, love for the brewing craft beer, and he passed away suddenly and unexpectedly last May at the age of 43. David Deal loved this industry. He worked for breweries in Brooklyn uh, before moving upstate to run tap rooms at Young Lion and Big Alice. He served this industry and served every community he worked in. He passed away suddenly <laughs> and unexpectedly in January, at the age of 40. Alex Coronado was a longtime brewer uh, for several breweries across the state. He had a voracious love for music, adventure, and disc golf, great food and great flavors. He passed away suddenly and unexpectedly last month at the age of 41. Are you kidding me? That was probably John Fisher's most spoken phrase. Whether John was a long time, John was a long time brewmaster at Genesee Brewing Company. He worked there from 1967 until he retired in 2017. John was larger than life. Uh, he was 75. Finally, Cornelius Henry Evans IV. To all that knew him, Neil. Neil's family brewing history in New York dates back to 1786 with the opening of Evans Brewery. Neil continued the family legacy and op by opening C.H. Evans Brewing and the Albany Pump Station in 1999. To all those that attended last night's party who was there, that was Neil's brewery. Um, so he was there for a long time. Neil battled cancer uh, in his wish before he died was that it would continue as a brewery, which the Weber family purchased and turned into common roots. Neil passed away last year at the age of 78. So. As I said at the beginning, it was a tough year. So let's have a moment of silence in their honor and remember the contributions that they gave to the New York State Brewing family. Thank you. I knew that was gonna be hard to get through. Um, so we're getting ready to kick off the beer. Don't open it yet, do the kickoff. But before we do, uh, I'd like to introduce Rich Vandenberg co-owner of Greenport Harbor Brewing Company on Long Island on the North Fork. Last year was Rich's final year as an elected board member. He is now serves as the first past president. Rich. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Paul. Um, it's great to be back at another terrific CBC. And, and uh, I want to start again by, by thanking Paul, uh, his staff, uh, the, the, the conference committee folks and our presenters, everybody for organizing and supporting another amazing event. One more round of applause for Paul and his staff. I, uh, of course, I'm also going to thank, again, our official sponsors, our, our vendors, our allied members who support the NYSBA and make it possible for us to put on such a fantastic multi-day conference. It's only because of what they do that the New York State Brewers Association is recognized as one of the foremost leaders in the country for having such a strong brewing community. That close-knit partnership, not only in the craft brewing business, but also in the business and governmental communities, makes all of us more successful. Yes, the community of our association is an amazing one. 
and never have I experienced a willingness to pay it forward as I've seen among our members and peers. It is that community that steps up, helps those in need, shares ideas, and supports the larger cause of building great craft beer rather than serving individual interests. And while the landscape has changed some in 15 years, the heart of what our community was founded on should remain our priority and continue to be nurtured. We all have to remember to take care of it and help it grow every day. Because without it, without a strong unified community, we lose the spirit of what brought most of us to the craft in the first place. So I challenge each of you, every one of you, to stay focused on our community spirit and our purpose of making, celebrating, and sharing great New York craft beer. Fifteen years ago, my brewery, Greenport Harbor, was born and I became a part of this community and it's been an honor to serve on the board for the past 11 years and most recently as its president. I'm proud of the things that we've accomplished and the organization we built. I'm also extremely grateful for uh, to have had the opportunity to meet and work with so many amazing people on behalf of our association. And I can say with extreme confidence, we are in good hands with this incoming board. Passionate, dedicated, intelligent people that will keep our community thriving continue to focus on our purpose and nurture us, the spirit of our association. So it's my distinct honor to introduce you to our next president, a person for whom I hold great respect in his vision, his knowledge of brewing, his clear understanding of the importance of our community, and our mission in keeping New York State craft beer strong. He's the right man for the job. I congratulate him in his new role. So please join me in welcoming Hutch Kugman. Morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? You good? Didn't stay out too late last night? I heard there were axes being thrown somewhere. Um, I'm kind of glad I was in bed. I think that was probably a smart choice. Um, you know, I'm going to be a little bit of a broken record, I think, in, in echoing some of the things that Paul and Rich have already said. Uh, but, you know, first thing I want to do is, is really thank all of you. Thank the members of the Hudson Valley who have uh, elected me to serve as board member for the last six years. Uh, it's been a long time. Um, the board in particular, you know, both the outgoing board members and incoming board members, uh, they do a lot for this organization and it's pretty much all on a volunteer basis. And I know a lot of what we do sometimes is invisible because it's internal, uh, but there really is a lot of great work being done. I want to recognize uh, the outgoing board members, uh, Chris Spinelli, uh, Ian Conboy, uh, I know Ian's here, uh, Chris Erickson, is Chris here? Chris, would you stand up for a second? Chris has given more to this organization than just about anybody else uh, in this room, so thank you. Um, thank all of our allied sponsors who make this possible, right? Um, this is, a, this is a, a great event for us and it doesn't happen without them. And thank all of you. If brewers are not interested in doing this, if the breweries are not showing up, then uh, we don't really have much of anything besides, uh, you know, besides what we're making for ourselves. I also want to give a round of applause for the staff. Uh, Paul, Chloe, Emily, Megan, uh, they work incredibly hard and really do an amazing job for such a small organization to, uh, to put on so many great events throughout the year, to do so much uh, in defending what we have built over the last 25 years and, um, and all the little, the little things that sometimes you forget about, the flyers and the posters and the, and the little tiny things that have helped us all get by the last few years. Uh, thank you also to Katie Anderson, our lobbyist. Uh, if you're going to be here later on, please come by. If you're a member, please come to the members meeting tonight, today at 5. I'm going to plug that a couple times. Uh, there's a lot of things we need to inform you about and also some opportunities for you to get more involved. Um, thank you for all of you who are already serving on committees, uh, members of the Farm Committee, the Competition Committee, and uh, the Conference Committee that helped vet all the seminars, put out all this together under Megan's leadership. Uh, those people really do work very hard, and for some of uh, those events, it's, um, it's quite a time commitment. So we really do appreciate that very much. Uh, like I said, there will be more opportunities to get involved, uh, particularly as we are expanding what the board can offer, and what the industry can do, or what we can do for ourselves. Uh, definitely some opportunities in marketing, uh, in the membership region, and also in technical regions. And we really need you guys to help us staff those committees. So if you are a member, please come to the uh, meeting today at 5 o'clock so we can talk about that. There's a lot of talent in this room, a lot more talent. I mean, the board is incredibly talented. 
Uh, there's a lot of knowledge here, but there's a lot of talent in this room. There's a lot of talent in your organizations. Uh, and there's no good reason why we shouldn't be putting that to good work, right? You all know a lot more about marketing and membership than I do. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of people who know a lot more about finances than I do. Um, I'm the guy who doesn't run a brewery, and there's a really good reason for that. Uh, numbers make my head spin. So, um, so we do, we do need more, more membership, more participation. So please, if you're interested, please make sure that you reach out to us, and we'll talk about that more at the meeting today at 5. Um, just for my own sort of curiosity, uh, just by a show of hands, how many people in this room have been involved in the, the beer industry for, say, two years? I'm guessing almost everybody, right? How about five years? Keep your hands up if you've been here five years. Ten. Fifteen. Now we're getting, we're that now. Twenty. Twenty-five. That's where you lose me. We got a couple twenty-fives left. Um, yeah, I see, I, I see my buddy Jeff back there, Don. Fred, oh, I'm not gonna keep going with Fred. Uh, little known fact, Fred was actually born in the malt room at FX Matt. Uh, there was no room at the inn, so they found a place to, to have the baby. Um, but just the reason I bring that up is, you know, for those of us that have been around for two years or five years or 20 years, you know, think about where the industry was at that time. All the prog progress that's been made since then. You know, I still remember, uh, since my buddy Jeff's in the back there, I'll, I'll poke fun at him, seeing you roll were they Hoff Stevens or Golden Gate kegs into the, the Syracuse uh, tap room? If you don't know what a Hoff Stevens or Golden Gate keg is, uh, be really glad. Um, imagine taking a regular keg and rolling it down all the stairs of the Empire State Building, and that's what you're trying to work with. Um, things have changed a lot over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I think largely for the better. We are in a much better place now than we were 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. But the things that got us there, I think, are the things that will help us continue to be successful as we move forward. I mean, there's no doubt it's been a very difficult year, difficult two or three years for everybody. Um, we've all seen our own businesses struggle. We've seen taste change. We've seen competition get fiercer. We've seen friends and, and their breweries struggle sometimes, and sometimes, unfortunately, close. But we also have openings, right? We have new people bringing more energy into this industry. So what are the things I think that worked for us in the past? Like, how did we get to this point? How did we become so successful, right? In New York, we're the second largest um, number of breweries in the country, right? It's a strong organization, a strong group. How did we get here, right? The things that we focused on in the past, dedication to quality, flavor, innovation, right? Educating your customers and engaging them, extending hospitality. But most of all, it was your passion. You, the community of brewers, are what made this, this industry strong. And you will be what continues to make this industry stronger as we move forward. So I just want to kind of reiterate that I think that what we have here is special. Now, in my job at the CIA, I get to work with lots of different industries. Chefs, food suppliers, wine, you know, wine industry, distillers. They don't have what we have. This is a unique group, right? We have a camaraderie and a collaborative spirit that kind of permeates our whole industry that does not exist in other places, right? If you need something, Hey, I'm out of mall. Kevin, can I come borrow? You know, can I come borrow a bag? Something? Sure, no problem. Come on by. I've got extra. Or if I want to know how to do something, I can call somebody up and say, "Hey, how did you do this?" Is uh, is Ryan Demler in the room? I'm gonna make fun of Ryan for a minute. No. Okay. I did. I was. I'm working on a new beer, a new ingredient I've never used. I saw that he used it. I shot him a text. Hey, what did you do? No problem. Here's the recipe. Right. That doesn't happen in other industries. That spirit of even in the face of. Harder, you know, harder to, uh, to acquire shelf space, more competition in the market, we still maintain that collaborative spirit. And I think that is part of what will help lead us into success in the future. So I'm not gonna keep talking too much longer. Um, I'm also not the one who's gonna open the beer, so don't open the beer yet. Uh, we've messed it up that one first year, and ever since then, we, you know, we kind of keep hammering home, don't, don't open the beer. Uh, but my point is just that I think those things that help lead us to success now are the things that are continuing to help us make success in the future as we get through what has been a difficult market in the last year or two. So continue to focus on quality and innovation, on engaging your customers and educating them, on providing variety in full flavored beers, using local ingredients, right? But most of all, continue to chase your passion. Your passion is what got you here. Your passion is what got this industry here, and we need to continue to embrace that. So thank you all very much for your time. Um, I'm looking forward to a great conference, as I know all of you are. I will see you somewhere on the conference floor if I didn't see you last night. I will see you at 5 p.m. if you're a member. Please make sure that you come to the members meeting uh, and we'll catch up over a beer. So thank you all very much. Damn, Hutch, I should have had you do my part. You did, that was awesome. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so it's uh, that time, uh, and again, I wanna thank um, Lucky Hair, uh, TLF Graphics, Ironheart Canning, and um, 
uh, New York Craft Malt, the Hop Guild for, for putting this all together. Chloe, I know you wanted to take a picture. So what we do, uh, for those that have been here, you know how this works. For those that have not been here, on the count of three, I want you to open your beer all at once. Wait. Not now. <laughs> Don't open the beer yet. All right? So this is, uh, this is to all of you for being here. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, let's have a great conference. We're super excited to have Kathleen Chavetta in just a minute. Is your, is your keynote. So in, th in, in a count of three. Ready? I'll do three, two, one. Ready? Three, two, one. Ch cheers, everybody. Cheers. cheers. All right. Real quick for, for the picture. So do a cheers. Hold, hold your can out to everybody. Awesome. Cheers to you. Really good beer. Good morning beer. It's made with tea. So there you go. Uh, Uh, now it's my uh, honor to introduce you to this morning's keynote speaker, Kathleen Chavetta. Kathleen Chavetta is CEO of Chavetta's Catering and Chicken Barbecue, a multi-generational family business that has a long tradition of being a Buffalo food staple. Committed to ensuring her family business uh, continues to thrive, Kathleen's role is to focus on strategy, culture, leadership development, and succession. She is a graduate of the UB School of Management Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership and holds seats on both its alumni and advisory boards. She volunteers time as a CEL mentor to support other business leaders. In her other life, she has served various uh, elected public school boards since 2015 and co-leads the Erie County Association of School Boards Legislative Advocacy Team. She's dedicated to her family as a mother and most recently as a grandmother, and I love this the most, she loves the Buffalo Bills most days. So it is my honor to uh, introduce Kathleen Chavetta. Am I on? I'm on. I can hear myself. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh my god, I didn't expect you to say good morning back. I'm not one of those, I can't hear you. That's not my style. Um, thank you, Paul, for that lovely introduction that I wrote myself. Um, you may have stepped on my face down in registration. I am super excited and happy to be here. Uh, and I know this was already said, but thank you so much to my new friends at Common Roots who did such an excellent job with the food last night. If you had the pulled pork, that was me. Uh, that was our marinade that they used to make that amazing pulled pork. And after I had my second helping, I texted my director of food and beverage and I was like, yo. I'm gonna hook you up with these people and I want you to find out um, what they did because it was great. So thank you to my new friends. All right, um, we are gonna talk about blending tradition with innovation. Um, we've been around for a really long time. We've learned a thing or two. Um, and one of the things that we've learned is that we can't stay the same. It's no good anymore. Um, if you have not heard of us, Thank you, because it's very humbling. It's very humbling to be in a place where not everybody knows your name. As Paul said, we're a multi-generation family business. I'm the third generation to lead the family business, but we do have generation four um, working in the business. We specialize in chicken barbecue. And if you've lived in New York State for a really long time, you know the style of chicken barbecue. Um, it's the vinegar-based half a chicken cooked on those really long grills over charcoal. We have um, little pockets of it around the state that do some version of it. If you are familiar with like um, the Oneonta Cooperstown area, you have Brooks Barbecue. In Syracuse and Central New York, you have like the State Fair Speedy. And then every part of New York State is great, guys. It's not that I'm playing favorites, but in Buffalo, um, you, you have us. Um, I, I'm not going to go through all this. Paul said it very well in the intro. Really, for the last 10 years, I have found a passion um, in school board service. I am no stranger to Albany. Um, my specialty as a school board member is legislative advocacy. I worked a lot with our local officials in the Western New York delegation to make sure that our kiddos have the resources they need to be successful. Um, in 2019, I accidentally made my way into UB Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership, and it's not an exaggeration to say it changed my life. It's literally the reason I'm standing here before you. 
And that really unlocked another passion in me, which you're going to hear about today. And that is supporting and coaching other businesses and in turn, <laughs> receiving coaching and support from them. I'm going to talk a little bit about the power of professional networks. You guys have a really great association and just a culture in your industry, and it's really powerful when communities support each other. I became a grandma last year, guys. Thank you. And I know what you're thinking. Kathleen, you don't look old enough to have a grandchild. You guys stop your embarrassing me. Uh, this is Charlie. And I have to tell you guys, Paul said it in the intro, I really feel as though, felt as though I was put on this earth to be a mom, right? I would have told you that my kids hung the sun, the moon, and the stars. And when Charlie was born, I learned something really profound, and that is that my kids are assholes. <laughs> Friends, if you're a grandparent, you know the pure joy that this is. And you know the only reason you even have those kids in the first place is so that this might happen someday. Otherwise, there's not much great about raising kids in retrospect. This, though, super fun. <laughs> all right, so what we're going to go over today, longevity, adaptability, innovation, right? All these buzzwords, competitive edge, sustaining your success. And we're going to close with what's your why. And I'm going to just explain what I mean by that when we get there. OK. I have a secret, and if you haven't figured it out by yet, I'm about to blow your mind. I do not brew beer. I know, what am I doing here? <laughs> uh, I would argue that we brew our own version of liquid gold. Ours just happens to taste a lot like vinegar. But I have to tell you, I'm trying to establish my credibility here. I really think that's where our differences end. Um, I, I get the sense, just quick show of hands, who runs a tap room or has some kind of restaurant or food component? Friends, we are all in the hospitality industry together, right? We are all in food service. Uh, we all are dealing with manufacturing. We're all dealing with shelf space and grocery stores, with manufacturing product we use in-house and that we try to sell. We have a lot of the same industry issues. Skyrocketing cost of goods sold, rising real estate prices, labor markets, the likes of which most of us have never seen before. We have a lot of commonalities um, in our industry, and I really identify with a lot of your issues and a lot of your struggles and even a lot of your successes. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about some of the lessons we have learned in our 70-year history. But I'm going to do that through the lens of somebody in the chicken barbecue industry. So if I make a couple of stabs at things in the brewing industry that maybe miss the mark, I hope you'll give me a little bit of grace, because <laughs> my heart's in the right place. Um, family business, how do we get started? Do we have family businesses in the room or people who have some family component? Right? It looks just like this, right? Everyone smiles and loves each other all the time. These people that are there no matter where you turn, when you wake up in the morning, when you go to the office, when you get together for holidays, it's the same friggin' people all the time. Uh, <laughs> family businesses are challenging. All business is challenging, but I'm here to tell you I'm a little biased. I think there are a lot of really unique uh, challenges when it comes to family business. My father um, is retired. That's why we didn't give him one of the shirts. My brother has since decided family business just wasn't for him right now and has moved on. And behind me, that's my oldest, um, who fortunately is, is, is still stuck it, stuck it out. Um, so how did we get started? We sold eggs. And then we got really innovative when we sold chickens. Um, and in the 1950s, our style of barbecue was kind of birthed out of Cornell University. And through the Cornell Cooperative Extension, um, poultry farmers around New York State learned this style of barbecue, and that's why you see it all across our state. So in the 1950s, we were like, let's give this a try. And we started grilling for local churches and fire departments, and it really took off. And then we added, added catering. I actually have paperwork in my house still from the 1960s for a 50th anniversary party that took place in 1961. It, it, it's kind of cool. In the 1980s, um, 
We put what we call our, our marinade, because that's what we want you to do with it. We don't marinade. We put that on the market. And my grandfather was so convinced that if you could get that marinade in the stores, it would put us out of business because no one would buy the chicken anymore. So he forbade my father from bottling it and selling it. So my father waited until my grandfather was out of town, and then he bottled it and sold it in secret. Really sounds like we're laying the foundation for healthy family trust and communication in business, doesn't it? That's a whole other TED Talk. Uh, in 2009, we opened a second location, which is um, a quick service style restaurant. We also do high volume of catering out of there. And in 2021, the second generation partners retired. We're going to come back to that. Fun facts, um, our annual revenue is about between six and a half and seven million dollars, split kind of equally between parking lot, chicken barbecue, catering, retail, that's those bottled products, our chips, our charcoal, um, and then takeout. And if you don't know what parking lot chicken barbecue is, it's literally exactly what it sounds like. And Western New York goes hard for parking lot chicken barbecue, right? We roll in, we set up in a parking lot, we cook chicken, you come get your dinner, we thank you, and you go home. It's, it's the core of what we do. Um, we feed about half a million people a year, super rough estimate, which is honestly probably low. That equates to about 17.5 million chicken dinners we've sold in our 70-year history. We do about a half a million units a year of bottled products. So about seven and a half million units um, have gone out uh, since my dad did that secret bottling back in the day. Adapting while staying true to your roots. So why did we need to adapt? Um, I came back to the business, I left for a couple of rebellious years of my 20s, in uh, about 2002. And after I had a few years under my belt, I started to try to carve out my own kind of niche in the business. And what I started to do was study data, which was the first time <laughs> that had been done, really, at Chevetta's. And I kind of noticed something that was a little concerning to me. And as I'm saying it, I now think a graph would have been helpful instead of what I'm about to do with my arms, which is this. But I didn't bring that. Um, sales were kind of doing this. And I think a lot of us know this plateau, right? We go through a period of really explosive growth and sales are climbing, 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 and then we kind of hit this plateau. That wasn't necessarily what was concerning to me. What I noticed was sales were staying steady because we kept inching up our prices. Our pieces, our units were actually falling. And I kind of carried that out. And I thought, that makes me a little nervous. So I brought it to my dad, and I was like, Dad, I did math. Look at this problem I think I've seen. And he was like, I don't know, honey. Things seem like they're going OK. I don't think you need to worry. And that's not a knock against my dad. I think we're so busy in the business that we're not necessarily pulling back and working on the business, looking at the business as a whole. If the money feels kind of the same, things are probably OK, right? And they were. They were fine at the time. And at that time, I didn't really have the confidence or the knowledge um, to say, like, no, no, I think we should look at this. So I'm embarrassed to tell you how long we slept on this. If you don't have a guess, about a decade. And I realized that's a little bit of a luxury. Because we had been around for so long, and we'd really built up customer loyalty, and we were so big, we could afford to sleep on something then for 10 years. That is not the case anymore. If we did that today, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> We'd be done. So what did we sleep on? We slept on the explosion of the catering industry, right? Back in the day, you couldn't get catering at every other building the way you can today. It grew up around us. The quick service style restaurant grew up around us. Well, we kind of rested on our laurels and sat in the middle and thought, the money feels OK. We must not need to do anything different. And what did that cost us? My friends, I'm afraid to do the real math, because I think it would make me throw up. Six figures easy in just the number of chicken dinners, and the revenue is probably in the millions of dollars. It cost us a lot to be asleep at the wheel. So we knew we needed to adapt eventually. 
But we had to spend some time thinking about what do we want to keep the same? And I'm here to tell you, friends, every one of us, no matter what your situation is right now, at some point, you're going to need to adapt. The, the market with the um, advancement of technology and rapidly changing consumer habits, it happens, but it would Claim my time. I have so much to talk about. <laughs> Am I good? No, Jim. Oh no. I'm gonna get to use my hands way less, which is not a bad thing because I picked today to try out a brand new natural deodorant, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little worried to lift my arms up too much. So we needed to figure out kind of who we were at the core. And I know I wrote this here, know who you are. And I know it sounds kind of flaky and cheesy a little bit maybe, but there's so much truth to this being important and I'm gonna to continue to talk about it throughout my presentation. So we needed to determine our core values and our brand identity. And I know a lot of you have this and I know some of you don't because you're busy doing other things and maybe there's one or two of you in the room that are like, eh, I don't see a lot of value in that. And I'm here to push back on that and say that there is, because your core identity, your core values, that brand identity, they really develop what I think of as a compass, and that's just what it sounds like, right? How, what's my true north? What's my strategic direction? What are my strategic goals? What do we want to do? Who's our market? Um, so we took some time, and I wish I could tell you more about our process. We just don't have the time for it. And I, to be honest, there's probably about six things in this presentation I wish I could walk you through our process in the hopes that it's helpful to you. I'm gonna put my contact information on the last slide. I love nothing more than talking to business people about business. If there's anything in this presentation that you would like to know more about, I'm super happy to share with you. Please feel free to reach out to me. So, we did a real like self-discovery. Who are we? Um, and here's what we came up with. Our mission, we build community through a shared food experience. That's it, simple, clean, short and sweet. They're not words we made up. Again, there's a process we walked through to get here. This is our compass. Our core values, commitment, we do what we say we're going to do. Community, we take care of our friends and neighbors. Our friends are our internal community, our team, our people who, who work the front lines, and then our neighbors are our external community, right? Whether it's our region or um, our customers. And tradition, we feed the generations. That one's my favorite. Stay tuned for a story at the end. Um, we're not gonna go through all these, but what we asked ourselves was, what does it look like to live those values, right? So if this is our mission and these are our values, what does that look like in real life? What does that look like every day? And we came up with our habits. And I, here's the reason I'm even telling you about these, because this makes for really consistent language across the company. From myself to my, my leadership team, my management team to the, for lack of a better term, the rank and file, these we just printed nice and big and they go on the wall in every room. And the reason we do that is to keep our language consistent and uniform, everyone's expectations are clear of what we expect when you are a member of the team at Chevetta's. And this is a really great teachable moment, coachable moments, right? You catch somebody doing something right, you can point right to it. Hey man, way to exceed expectations, we really appreciate that. Or on the flip side, you can say, you jumped out early when there was a lot of work for everyone else to do, man. Like we gotta be invested in everyone else's success as well. These are really powerful for our team. All right, how can traditions coexist with innovation? First, we had to determine what our traditions are. And I might be saying traditions because we've been around for 70 years, but if you haven't been around for 70 or 100 years, you've only been around for a couple of years, you might think you don't have traditions, then don't think of it as traditions. 
Think of it as what are the things you guys do at your core that make you you? What are the things that you do that you like to do? So first we identified what our traditions were for us, easy. A parking lot chicken barbecue, man. People love it and bringing people together around food. I know that sounds over simple, but it, that really helped us determine strategic direction. What I mean by that is, what opportunities did we want to take on? We'll maybe talk a little bit more about that. Then we had to determine how we had to adapt. And this wasn't one conversation where we sat down and talked for 30 minutes and we're like, all right, we're clear. This was some extensive work. We knew we had to be more efficient. We knew we had to be more mobile. We had to make it easier for people to get to us or for our food to get to people. And we had to be more dynamic. Our customers wanted options, not the same things we'd been doing over and over and over and over again. Uh, we needed to understand our market, and I'm gonna be honest with you, this is something we still struggle to do. And maybe you guys as an industry have really good data on who your customers are. Um, we've had to work to figure that out, because my answer in the beginning was like, I don't know, hungry people. Um, but it's hard to market to just everybody. Um, responding to consumer trends while maintaining that compass. We have industries that are rife with trends. I think you guys do specifically, right? Lots of trends in our industry. And while we need to be responsive to trends, it's also not a good idea to chase every trend that comes along. Because what happens there is that that's very expensive. We're learning something, in some cases, from the ground up every time, and then we become diffuse. Our customers aren't really sure who we are or what we do. So for us, we, we kind of figured out what some of our trends were. For you guys, I'm not here to tell you what your trends have been and are because you know that best, but I know other than beer has been a big trend because I had daughters who are all college age who would had their trulies and their twees, and I'm like, what's a twee? And they had to explain it to me because I was old. Um, I know just anecdotally, I've seen a lot more um, NA stuff myself. And shout out to the people who are doing NA stuff, because ever since I turned 40 a bunch of years ago, alcohol makes me really tired. Um, and sometimes I like to have a nice grown-up looking drink myself, and I really appreciate I really appreciate the mocktails, the stuff like that where I can look really classy, um, but I'm not. THC and cannabis is a frontier for all of us. We're all learning how, how is that going to affect the business landscape? How, where are the potential opportunities to integrate there? I feel like, and maybe I'm wrong, THC cannabis go much better with beer than they do with chicken barbecue, but as I'm saying that, maybe not, man. Hungry people. <laughs> <laughs> want, want food. <laughs> hmm, maybe I just gave myself a marketing idea. Um, and then what's next? It, we always have to be keeping our eye on what's next. We have to be educated. We have to come to things like this. We have to talk to people in our industry to figure out what's on the horizon. Um, we talked about this on the last slide. There's a, it's really important to figure out who your customers are, what they want, how you can effectively and efficiently deliver it to them. And again, you might have some standard, standards across industries, but there might be something unique about you that attracts a, dim, a different demographic. And even if not, it's really helpful to know who you need to market to. Um, Think about asking your customers for data. Um, in Western New York, I, I'm not really gonna get into all the details, but um, we've done some work with UB School of Management because they have MBA and other students who need capstone projects. So they'll do work like figure out your customer demographics for you for free. So even if you're not in Western New York, um, there might be universities in your area who will help you, especially with marketing work for nothing. Um, knowing when you need to change course. I've done so many things wrong where I'm like, this seems like a good idea. I'm gonna change this thing we've been doing for a long time. And then six or 12 months later, I'm like, that was really dumb. I've made a horrible mistake. And we need to reverse course. You have to be able to be dynamic and know when you have to roll something back in. Um, one example of us not understanding what our customers want from us is the first year we went to the Taste of Buffalo. And if you don't know, it's a really big food festival that happens in Western New York. And we used those core values to determine if that was a good opportunity for us. We'd never done it before. 
commitment community tradition, right? It's a big tradition in Buffalo. It happens every year. It's a community event. It's a shared food experience. We're in. But we were really cute the first year, and we tried so hard to get people to understand that we do so much besides chicken. And what happened is we went in really unprepared for the onslaught picture. And maybe you guys have done this at festivals. You look up from your counter, and you see a sea of people, and you know, I don't have enough for all of you. And this is going to be really embarrassing. And you're really going to be mad at me when I tell you we're all out. We had to adapt and come up with a new plan the next day because we were so unprepared. People were like, it's so cute that you guys sell a tomato salad. Where's your friggin' chicken? And we had to just lean into that. That's what people want. So the next generation, that's me. Um, I did my very first picnic with my dad when I was eight years old. I worked as a kid. Like I said, I left for a couple of years. I came back in 2002. Guess when we started the baton handoff of the retirement of the second generation on my takeover of leadership as a third generation in 2020 and 2021. Remember what we were doing then? That was a real fun time to be stepping in a leadership role. I'm going to talk very quickly, I hope, about COVID because, not because I, I, I want to brag about how great it was for us, but because we really used it as the springboard to make innovation part of our culture. So we shut down about this time. You guys might remember the very next week, we hit the ground running. Parking lot chicken barbecue, man, right? We can cook chicken in a parking lot during COVID. Everything else was closed. Um, at that time, I think it's helpful to know that the parking lot chicken barbecues we had done were all chicken barbecue fundraisers. We didn't do them on our own. We worked with a partner, right? Church, school, Girl Scout troop contracted with us. We'd come in and cook. They'd serve the dinners. We had only started piloting the pop-up chicken barbecues the summer before. And so the difference is no nonprofit in the middle. It's just us in a parking lot. If we sold 300 dinners at a pop-up, we thought that was really successful. During COVID, they were doing 1,500, 1,800, 2,000. We had to start scheduling people whose job was traffic control because we were pissing off the towns we were in because we were backing traffic up, up the street. And we thought, with all due respect to the fear and the death and the global destruction COVID costs, Basically, what was happening is people would pull into our parking lots, they would roll down their windows, they would throw fistfuls of money at us, and they would drive away. We realized that we were very fortunate to do well at a time where so many other businesses were struggling. And unfortunately, not all of our friends and colleagues made it through that time. But we did that because we hit the ground running with adaption. We were flexible, and we weren't afraid to take a risk and give it a try. So we had to ask ourselves, I'm not going to go through all these, where are our new opportunities, man? What's, what's next for us? And we kind of divided that into external sales and internal business processes. And the study we've done and the work we've done on our internal business processes is, again, a whole other TED Talk. Um, we started to ask ourselves a question. And maybe you guys have had the same struggles we can't get enough of the right kind of people for the jobs we need. And we kept seeing that over and over. So we flipped the question, if we can't get enough people for these jobs, how can we need fewer people? And that really launched us on this efficiency study and this innovation study of how we can decrease the number of bodies we need to make the operation run. I do want to touch on one point, and that is changing business partnerships and vendor vend or relationships, um, we took a really hard look at the people we were doing business with. And this can be hard if you've been in business a long time, right? We get those partners. For us, the Cisco's, the US Foods of the world. And we get really comfortable in those relationships because they're nice to us, because they give us football tickets, and they take us to hockey games, and we build relationships. And so when our contract's up, we don't necessarily price it out. We don't necessarily put things out to bid because we're comfortable in those relationships. We took a hard look at some of that stuff, and it was tough because we changed relationships that were decades old because it just made more sense for the bottom line. 
I'm not going to read all these, but these are some questions when you are trying to do this brainstorm for what's next for us that you can kind of run through. I do want to point out a couple of them. Do we need to diversify? Sometimes the answer to this is no. Diversification is what made it possible for us to be successful through COVID. So maybe the answer is yes, but sometimes it's not. Do we need to expand? Does it make more sense to contract? A smaller operation is easier to run. And sometimes not every lane of our business is profitable if we are diverse. Um, the last one I want to point out is where do we need or want to be in three to five years? This is really powerful too, I think. I think five years is kind of a stretch, especially um, if you're a newer business. But what we do is a three-year plan. Where do we want to be in three years? Okay, to hit that, where do we need to be in two years? Then where do we need to be a year from now? And then what do we need to be accomplishing in the next quarter in order to line all that up? Um, oh, analysis paralysis. I had a story, but if I told every story I wanted to, we'd be here for an hour and a half. Um, the moral of the story is, I, and I've gone through this myself, I have a tendency to want to think a thing to death before I'm sure I want to give it a try. Um, and that doesn't really necessarily go hand in hand with, with innovation. You have to be ready to prepare to, prepare to take a calculated risk. Uh, the competitive edge, okay. I wanna touch on something that was said earlier, um, and that is how to stand out in a crowded market, right? You have a very collaborative industry here in New York State. You guys work together really well, you treat each other as friends, but at the end of the day, there's a little bit of competition happening in the room, right? We're, we're selling kind of similar things, we're um, having a similar experience maybe, that's okay, it's a big enough industry that there are customers enough for all of us, but how do we gain a little bit more of that market share? How do we get a little bit more people to come to us or to be really brand loyal to us so that we're gonna have sustained relationships with them over time? They're not just our customers this weekend or this month or this year, we're building customers for life. I know I said it already, Knowing who you are and what you do is really important. So three questions. Who are you? What do you do? How are you different? The answers to these questions cannot be, I brew beer, I sell beer, I sell different beer. It's just not enough. Um, and that's not just true in beer, I'm not picking on you. It's true in food um, as well. We have to be able to stand out from the people around us. And I think one of the things that helped make us really successful for a long time, a few things. We had a really unique product. We were really invested in making sure it was a high quality product. And most importantly, we worked really hard to make sure that it was a consistent product over time. That set us apart a little bit from the people who were trying to do the same thing that we were doing. So what do you do or sell that's a little different from the people around you, and how can you lean into that as your brand differentiation? Another way to distinguish yourself is with brand values. I know I said that again, um, but how can you connect with your customers on a deeper level? Young people today, and I'm Gen X, so I mean, you know, the younger millennials, the Gen Zs, brand values are incredibly important to them. And they do have a little bit of spending power. And over time, they're gonna have more spending power. They don't just want to buy your product. They want to understand who you are as an organization, as a company, as an industry. What do you stand for and what's important to you? They, they don't just want to visit a place, buy a product. They really want to understand what you represent. And, and I want to just tell, I will tell a little bit of a story here for something that we did that was meaningful. And it was a few years back, and it got to be June, so it was Pride Month. And we were like, you guys are all like, yeah, Kathleen, we, we both did that 100 years ago. Everyone does that. Well, we were a little more, 
I'm trying to think of something to say that's not baby boomer, but because I don't want it to sound like an insult, but we were, we were just led by people who came from a little more conservative time. Why do you want to make a political statement? We didn't really do things like that before. And so all we did was change our logo for Pride Month, just made it a little rainbow. And it you know, got some mixed feedback. And then the next year, we kind of did it again, and we leaned into that. Um, and the reason we did this, I want to mention, is not just because it's trendy and everyone does it, but because community is our core value. And to us, community means everybody. And we wanted our people to know that community means everybody. So the last year, or the third year that we did this, we put a little blurb, right? Nothing crazy, just, you know, here to honor Pride Month, we want you to know, our friends, that we see you. And as you can imagine, again, mixed things on social media. There were people we had to block because they just said nasty, awful things. But something so simple, and again, I realize everyone else did this years ago, but it, it took us a little longer. We got so much love from our customers. And I'll never forget one comment. And then <laughs> this girl said, why am I all of a sudden crying over this chicken barbecue company that I loved so much? And that was really just touching to me. Did that translate to a sale that minute? No, probably not. But did that endear us to her um, as a brand that she had already loved? Yes, it did. OK, this is a real hot take. I want to check my time here. OK. Um, no one wants to work, right? We've all heard this. Some of us have even said it. No one wants to work, right? I actually think that's wrong. And I don't know how it is in your industry, but in my state restaurant association, this is a thing that gets said a lot. No one wants to work. I don't agree. Are there people who don't want to work? Yes. Those people have been around since work was invented. There's always going to be that edge. But my friends, I don't think it's the case industry-wide. And I think some people, not anyone in this room, I think some people use it as an excuse because maybe people just don't want to work for them. That's my really hot take. Um, the silver tsunami is a thing if you've never heard this. Baby boomers are retiring and have been retired at a breathtaking pace. They are leaving in the millions every year. Some estimates say 10,000 baby boomers retire a day. In less than a decade, they're all going to be retired. Replacement workers are not coming into the market at the same. I don't like the term replacement workers. I just made that up, and it sounds cold. But that's what it is. They're not coming in at the same rate they're leaving. There are going to be, and this is part of what's happening now, there are fewer workers for the same number of jobs. So how do we be a good place to work? We have to be a good place to work. Because friends, we're not all competing for customers, we're starting to really compete for employees. And the landscape of the workplace has changed a ton. And so I'm going to just throw out a couple names of places in Buffalo. You have Big Ditch and you have Resurgence. Both great places. Both have plenty of customers. Been to both. They're kind of competing for the same workers. And not only are they competing for the same workers with each other, they're competing with Fat Bob's, which is a barbecue place down the street. They're not even a brewery. They're competing with the UPS, with the Amazons. Um, employees want choices. They're reclaiming some of the power that, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, however you feel about it, that's what's happening. We have to set ourselves apart for our employees because we can't run our businesses without them. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story that it kicked something off for me. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the culture work that we've been doing. We had a husband and wife who worked for us together. The wife doesn't work for us anymore because apparently she can make more money being a bartender than she could for me, which I believe, right? <laughs> That's good money. Um, and I overheard the two of them talking one day about grocery shopping that week. And the wife was in tears because she said, we can't cover groceries this week. We're going to have to put it on a credit card. And oh my God, did that hit me like a ton of bricks. This couple could not afford to work for me together because they couldn't buy groceries to feed their kids. That was no good. It couldn't be. I had to do something about it. Some of that's just math, right? It really let me know that, you know what? 
our compensation is really competitive in our industry, but what did I just say? Our industry is competing with other industries, with the Amazons, with the UPSs. We needed to find other ways to be able to compete because I can't pay people $32 an hour. Um, so wages and benefits were certainly part of it. We've taken a lot from profit and put it into people. Number one, because we think that's the right thing to do. But number two, just because, again, it's math, guys. It's marketing. We need the people to run the businesses. So what we did was, um, as part of the culture work, right, I wanted to find out, are we a good place to work? I think we're competitive with salary and benefits. But what's it like to work here? And frankly, the culture that I inherited, I will just say, it wasn't one that I was going to thrive in as a leader. I had to put a lot of energy into improving our culture. And if you guys know, that takes a long time. It's not something that happens overnight. There were people who had to go that had been with us for a long time. But we needed to get the right people on the bus and the wrong people off the bus in order to start to build a positive culture to make people want to come to work. And we had to make some tough choices about that. But what we did was we brought in an outside facilitator to um, take an employee, give an employee satisfaction survey at an all-hands meeting. Leadership left the building. We weren't even in the building for it. And he brought us the results. And he said, Kathleen, this is just rich with opportunity. And I said, that's a really nice way of saying we kind of suck. And people don't necessarily love to work here. Don't get me wrong. There were certainly positives. But he was right. There was a lot of opportunity there. And this is work that is ongoing for us. He continues to come back. Um, again, this is one of the things I wish I could tell you more about. We just don't have the time. But we continue to work on this and will continue to work on this forever. Our culture work is ongoing. Our communication work, our constructive feedback work is ongoing because we want to be a place that allows people to thrive. And I realize not everyone's going to love coming to work every day, but we at least want them to like it, right, and not be miserable with us. I can't stress enough how important I think it is um, to use this as a competitive edge. We have to have the right people, and we have to have happy people and again, it's the right thing to do, but it's also math. People who like their jobs produce better for you. All right, collaboration over competition. This is a thing, um, Hutch, I think, talked about it when we were up here, right? This is a thing you guys do super well. You excel at it. How can we work together for the betterment, betterment of our community? Or how can we work together because it's kind of cool and kind of fun and maybe it'll make us money? Both are good reasons. Um, I really like creative thinking when it comes to this. Really being open to opportunities for people to do work together. And you guys do this so well. I don't even need to talk about it a ton. I'll just tell you a little bit about we do, what we do. Again, community is a core value. We find um, that we really have some great partnerships with some of the people in our community. And one more thing I forgot to say. Customers love collaboration. They love to see us work together. They love to see us work together within our industry, right? Because then we're all friends. There's so much tension and conflict in our country, in our society, in our culture right now. They love when they can see we work together positively. Um, and I love cross-industry collaborations as well. We work with Compeer, a local mental health organization in Western New York. Um, Hearts for the Homeless is a great Western New York organization. Some of you might know 26 Shirts, Del Reed, founder of Bill's Mafia's company. Um, we're just starting to do a little bit of work with him as well. I do want to take a minute. Let me just check my time here. Um, and I want to talk about the importance of professional networks. For me, that was the center of entrepreneurial leadership. Um, you guys have a great organization in here. And it's certainly part of your professional network, but it's not quite what I mean um, when I'm talking about this. So for me, CEL is a collection. It's an organization of people of different businesses of all kinds. In my CEL group, I work with Compere, House for the Homeless. That's how we ended up with these partnerships. Um, they have nothing to do with the food industry. We work with website companies. And what we do, support each other, encourage each other, and perhaps most importantly, is we hold each other accountable. We meet once a month, we share our wins, we share our struggles, 
and we shared deliverables. Hey, you said you were going to do this thing last month. Did you do it? And over time, you build, we, we have built trust with each other, and that allows us to say things the other people don't want to hear. I came to my group with something I wanted to do that included a family member, and I was really excited about it, right? Bringing a family member into the business, this is going to be great. Here are all the great things about it. And my peer group, one by one, went around the table and said, this is so hard for me to say. I don't think it's a good idea. And here's why. And you know what? They were right. I was about to make a bad choice, and I needed that outside perspective to steer me in the right direction. And I'm going to tell you that as much as I encourage you to continue to do what you're doing now, and that is to network with each other, there's a lot of power in including people in your professional groups that don't have anything to do with your industry, because sometimes they give you a really fresh perspective that you haven't thought about. Um, and it's great to have an open mind to that. So I don't know what that looks like in your region of the state or in your communities. People can go out and start their own. But this has been revolutionary for me, and particularly with that accountability piece. And if you're an organizational leader, you know, they say sometimes it's lonely at the top. You might not have a peer within your organization that you can kind of talk to about these things. This has been so powerful for me. Um, we don't need to talk about sharing resources because you guys already know how to do that. Um, this just goes with creative thinking and innovation. We asked ourselves, who doesn't use their parking lots in the winter because we wanted more parking lots to cook in? Um, ice cream stands. I'm going to skip over that. OK. Sustaining success, consistency and quality, pay attention to the details. I already told you that one of the reasons I think we've been very successful, high standards of quality, high attention to consistency. We had a lot of turnover, as I mentioned, after COVID because we started a lot of culture change. And the work landscape just changed. I started to have chicken that didn't taste like the chicken I'd had last week. And then I heard from a couple of people, hey, man, I had one of your dinners. And it didn't quite taste like Chevetta's. And when I tell you this made my heart drop into my stomach, one of our brand identities is consistency. And I was starting to worry that we were being inconsistent. And so we put a lot of work into developing systems and how to measure our consistency. I know consistency is especially important in your industry. And I'm here to tell you, I've eaten more chicken in the last two years than I have in the 20 before because I need to be out in the field testing that. I'm sure you guys have no problem drinking your own beer. Um, <laughs> what do you want your legacy to be? Whether you're in this business for a short time and your goal is just to eventually sell and get out, or you have been in business for an incredibly long time and you're just legacy driven, what do you want to leave behind for whoever is going to come next, whether it's your family or not? I think those are really important conversations to be having with yourself or with your people. We're so busy managing the day-to-day -to, -day to our business that we don't sometimes look down the road. And if we don't have one eye on what's down the road, it's a little bit harder to get there. Um, I want to talk about understanding your financials because I know it seems so simple. Um, but a lot of us just don't, right? We got into a business because we liked doing what we do. We're not accountants. We're not MBAs. All of a sudden, we have this business around us. A lot of business owners I talk to don't have a clear understanding of their financials. I mentored a girl this year who opened a second location. And she was like, if I get one sale a day, this is retail, I'm really happy. And I was like, girlfriend, does one sale a day cover your bills? And she's like, I don't know. And I was like, that's an important thing for you to know, because this place could be losing money. And it's bad for your operation. Um, we talked a little bit about strategic planning, about the importance of defining goals. Again, I understand it's, it can be hard to work on the business, but it's important to define where you want to go. Writing goals down and planning for them statistically makes you more likely to reach them. And for succession planning, it is not ever too early to start thinking about what happens with your business next. In particular, if you are a family operation, I am seeing today the effects of decisions my grandparents made well intended, well intended, but they did not set me up with a strong succession plan. And if you don't know, do you know what the failure rate is on third generation family businesses? It is greater than 90%. Greater than 90% chance 
I will not make it to hand off to the fourth generation. I don't think that's going to be me. But a lot of the reason that happens is because there wasn't strong succession planning. So whether your goal is to have family come into the business or you just want to sell it for maximum profit, succession planning is important. You guys have a session on it tomorrow. I would encourage you to check it out. Build your bench. I want to talk about this. I'm going to list, I know we're almost out of time, but I'm going to list to you all the things I'm really, 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 really good at. Ready? Thinking and telling people what to do. That's it. Those are the only two things I'm really, really good at. I'm not saying I'm not good at anything else or I can't do anything else, but those are the things that I, I really feel comfortable with. I need to surround myself with people who are better than I am at all the things I'm not good at. We can't be threatened by that. We can't be discouraged by that. We don't know everything, friends. As much as I'd like to think I do know everything, we don't. And I've worked really hard to try to build a team that's really excellent in places where I am not. I'm not really good at talking to my team about their feelings so much. I have a wonderful HR woman who's so compassionate and so sensitive, and she can help support me in that work, and I could go on and on. I told you before, sometimes the guy who got you here isn't the guy who'll get you there. Remember when I said we had to take a really long look at vendor relationships? We had to end, in one case, I had to make a phone call to end a 30-year business relationship because I knew he'd gotten us here he wasn't the guy to get us there. And that was really hard to do, but it was really important for the health of my business. Somebody told me once to think of the business as um, a person who can't speak for itself. And it's my job to care for it like I would one of my own children or my grandchildren. I think we've established. I like them better than my kids. Um, and that was really helpful to me for times where, oh, I don't know, maybe we could stick with this guy a few more years. That's not what the business needs, and you have to make tough choices. And taking care of your own, S-H-I-T, here's what I mean by that. For those of us that are business leaders, we're setting the standard and the culture and the expectations in our organization. And if we're not, somebody else is doing it for us. And you have to be sure that whoever that person is, is the person you want setting the culture and the standards and the expectations for your company. And again, I don't mean to keep picking on my family businesses. You especially need to have your shit together because family baggage trickles over into the company and it becomes ingrained as part of your culture. So if you have two partners, not I mean names, who don't like each other and everybody knows it, your culture becomes divisive because people know who they can go to to get the answer they want. That's no good. All right. Last thing, and then I'm going to be done. Um, recapping kind of some of the, the points that we went over, I want to talk to you about what's your why. Why do we do what we do? And this is a really important thing to find out because maybe I'm just speaking for myself. Some days, this is hard. Some days we're not sure if we're going to be successful. We're not sure if we're going to fail. We're not sure if we're going to have money to do the next thing. We're not sure if we're going to be profitable. We're not sure if we have the energy to do this anymore. Are you getting a picture of what I talk to my friends about? Not all the time, but right, sometimes we have those days. And we got to know why we do what we do. There's a guy by the name of Simon Sinek, I think his name is. He does a YouTube video on an exercise you can do for what's your why. We're not going to talk about that. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about my why and why I do what I do. So if you don't know, in Western New York, we have something called the Erie County Fair, one of the largest and oldest fairs in America. It's a 12-day event, and over those 12 days, we feed about 25 to 35,000 people. It's a really big event for us. And I love to go sit out. We have a big tent, like a circus tent, and I like to go sit and work or eat, be among the people, and just listen. How does their food look? Measuring quality. What are they saying about it? Did they like it? I, you know, I'm not exactly invisible if I'm wearing a Chevetta shirt, but I'm not making myself stick out either. And one day, um, I'm working, and a family came and sat down next to me. And there was a woman about 30, mom, her mother, grandma, and then an 18-month-old kid. And I'm working, 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 and I hear the mom say, are you ready to try your first Chevettas? And I'm like, what's going on down there? 
And then I hear the grandma say, this was your pop pop's favorite place to come, and it was always the first stop every year. And now I'm like, I have got to know who these people are, right? Commitment, community, tradition. We feed the generations. And so it turns out that this is a mom, her mom, her child, and her dad, the grandpa, had passed away just a little bit earlier that year. And it was their family tradition to come to the fair every year. And the first thing they did was come and have a Chevetta's barbecue. And now they're passing it along to the third generation of their family. And their dad just missed it by a couple of months. And when I tell you this is the first time I've ever told that story in public without crying, <laughs> it's the truth. Because that moves me. What a privilege that is. And you might be thinking, don't take yourself so seriously. You're serving chicken dinners. And that's true for everyone who's not me. It was a privilege. It is a privilege that generations of people in Western New York choose us to share their special moments. And that is the thing that keeps me going on those dark days where I'm like, man, I have a greater than 90% chance of fucking this up. <laughs> Do I want to keep going? And I think of that family, and yes, I do. And I'm not saying your why, if you don't know it, has to make you maybe cry in front of a few hundred strangers. But maybe, should it? It should move you, my friends. And if you think about it on the drive home and you don't come up with anything, don't worry. It might take a little time for you to figure out what's your why. And I don't care what your position is, whether you're the business owner, the leader, whether you're head brewer, whether you're doing the taxes, I would encourage you to find out what's your why because it becomes your core purpose and why you do what you do. And I think that's it, my friends. This is my contact information. I cannot stress enough how passionate I am about lifting businesses up and encouraging them and supporting them. I don't care if you're, if you're in Buffalo and you want to grab a beer or a coffee. I would love to. If you're elsewhere in the state and you just want to connect because you want to hear a little something more about um, a process that we did or a story I told, please feel free to reach out. Um, it's so wonderful when we support each other. This is hard work. And I'd love to become part of your network. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, she didn't write this part. Uh, when I lived in Texas, my parents would come down and visit me, and they go, what can we bring you? And being a Rochesterian, I would always say, Swigel's hot dogs and Chevetta's. Like, I mean, it's really, it's the real deal. Um, so we're about ready to uh, begin the conference. Um, you'll see the beer stations around. If everybody could do the best that they could to make sure that the cans end up, uh, to, we were going to recycle those, uh, pack techs, all of those things, and trash, that would be great. Uh, we'd appreciate it. So here's a quick look at today's schedule. Uh, seminars start at 11 AM. Please take a few minutes, uh, relax, walk around, visit some exhibits. Thanks, everybody.